bitters and I like them cynically cold, but they're a bit of a nuisance to make, so I made a few this morning so they'd be ready for... Well, whoever dropped in, that's logical. A relative, perhaps? Say your distant auntie from Nutsford stops by to express her grief and profound sorrow at your recent loss, and you say, would you like a margarita? I have a slew of them in the fridge. <laughs> Surprise! you haven't laid out a dip in your sorrow. Uh, Shall I ask the question again? Were you expecting company, Jenny? Don't grow me this way, John. You sound like Derek. I drink too much. There, my grand confession. Now, I can imagine being married to Derek would cause anyone to require at least a local anesthetic. Oh, no, this predates Derek. I remember the first time I came home from the pub, pissed to the gills. My father took one look at me and said sadly, Janet, you must be drunk. And I've been following his orders ever since. We've been concentrating on each other for all the while, easing up on the distilled spirits. Oh, spirit. Sorry? I don't believe in ghosts, but I swear he's loitering on the premises. I can feel his tangible lethargy about the place. Let's go on upstairs to bed oh. and we'll scare away those spirits with our own form of telekinesis. Yes, John, I'm not going back up there. But he died in this room. Yes, that's why I'm sleeping here. This room has lovely associations now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go on up to bed and we'll create some free associations in there. No, John, someone might show up. Such as who? Oh, the coroner's assistant, my auntie from Nutsford, Someone from town had to visit the grieving widow. Imagine if they find me in this minimal state of dress with my husband's handsome business partner in an unmade bed in the middle of the afternoon. Three of the seven warning signs of life imprisonment. Well, there's a few quick nibbles in a few random zones. <laughs> 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 Oh. 
Fool's child, there's no need to wear a coat. I think you should take it off. <laughs> and? I really can't do this. I am not going to be able to undress in front of people. I'm sorry. I can handle the bra and panties because I mean they're no worse than a bathing suit. I mean a lot of bathing suits are a lot more revealing than this. But I'm not going to be able to take my bra off in front of people so we're just going to have to change it or something. Where's Hal? 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 Yeah. What? What? Why are we stopping? Harley, there's a wardrobe problem. It's a lack of wardrobe problem and I'm serious about it, Hal. I really am. <laughs> citizens of Blue Haven will be piling into this theater to see if what we have should be Broadway bound or bound and gagged. And we have yet to run a accomplice all the way through to its conclusion without stopping. Now, I told you this morning I wanted to rehearse the entire play with all the special effects. I consider the removal of your bra to fall under the category of special effects. You can't make me do it. You're correct. I can't make you do it. But I am allowed to fire you. I mean, you read the script. It indicated there was nudity in the role. I told you there was nudity in the role. You accepted the role. Where does it say that there's nudity? Oh, please, Paige. 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 On page 34, she, me, you, she reaches behind her, unfastens the clasp of her bra, lets it slide down one arm, then hesitates and with a shrug lets it slide slowly down both her shoulders. It doesn't say I'm nude. Oh, what did you think it meant, Harley? You take off a bra, you're nude. Look, it's not even full frontal. I, I mean, people display themselves like this on beaches all over the world. PBS shows it with narration by Morgan Freeman. <laughs> I mean, you know, this script is in the script. You wrote it. You can change it. You wrote it. I wrote it for a reason. Yeah, you wrote it, so I'd have to <coughs> dress in front of a lot of people. You could put a picture of that outside the theater and sell more tickets. I wrote it in order to show the sexual tension between Janet and Melinda. That is me taking off my bra is not tension. Me taking off my bra is release. They're not that big, Harley. <laughs> Erica, you notice Hal didn't write any scene where he has to drop his jockey shorts. Be grateful for small favors. <laughs> Look, Harley, it is important to both the uh, scene and the characterization. What characterization? Who are we kidding here? This isn't a role. I'm just a centerfold stuck between two series articles and playboy. Oh. Come on, Harley. You come on. I don't even appear until the last page of Act 1, and here we are, halfway through Act 2, Scene 1. You want my tits hanging out, and I still haven't spoken a line. Okay, look. <laughs> Melinda's bra is, to me, like the, uh, the raft of Huckleberry Finn. Oh. Going down. Okay, okay. <laughs> one from the start. The audience is already speculating whose side you are. I mean, you know how the audience wants to stay one step ahead in the thriller. One step ahead? Oh, <laughs> are you kidding me? I've done sleuth everywhere. <laughs> Except New York. I've done dialing for murder, writing your murder, stage blood, stage fright, death trap, mouse trap, death mouse. <laughs> and it's like a chess game between you. It's like a checker game between you and the others. <laughs> Which is why it's so important that we keep startling the audience in an effort to stay one step ahead. You know, uh, the hero did it. The victor did it. It was Watson. It was Holmes. It was the butler. It was everybody. It was nobody. God damn it. What's the matter? Uh, I, did, I was trying to time this all the way through from the start of Act 1 with intermission. Didn't I tell you people I didn't want to stop her anything? Thank you so much, Harley. Let's see, now, oh, with 20 minute intermission, puts us at 9.33, it's not bad. Is this a break then? That seems to be. Does anyone mind if I smoke? I always ask. Oh, uh, honey, you have uh, my pack too? The camels, not the American spirits. I think you put them in your purse before you left the house. Do you know what the problem here is? The problem is, the longer you let the audience second guess the show, at least once during the course of the evening, they're going to guess right. I mean, how many different permutations of four actors can there be? Four actors? They're making thrillers now with three actors, with two. Jackie Mason is Agatha Christie. <laughs> <laughs> well, how long do you think they're going to second guess us with the couples? Hard to say. Acting and writing and directing in one's own play, perspective is not always the easiest commodity to come by. 
But I do think the lesbian thing's going to surprise him. Uh, but it's then that the real plotting begins. When? <laughs> At the intermission. <laughs> Have you ever even seen a two-act thriller? Uh, I've only studied serious plays. Right, I forgot. Your alma mater had such high standards. If you can read this matchbook, you can act. <laughs> well, in my experience with the genre, I've learned that no matter how intricately plotted the piece has been throughout Act One, this is nothing compared to the plot twist the audience creates during the intermission. I worked at Slum Theater and uh, Elizabeth Adams, where the actor's dressing room ran right alongside the air vent of the lobby. During the intermission, you could hear every audience member express their opinion on what was going to happen during Act Two. After about 10 minutes of that, we didn't even want to go on with the rest of the show because what was actually going to happen was paltry compared to what the audience had <laughs> So what do you think the audience would be speculating at our intermission? Accomplice? My guess is a lot of people will say that Derek is still alive. Even though they've seen me electrocute him. Mm -hmm. Part of that will be pragmatic. I mean, it's logical to assume that with only four characters in the play, no death is real until at least mm, midway act two. Yeah, but do you think they'll guess the real end? I don't know. Well, do you think you would? Again, I don't know. I read the script. I just hope that the pray that the audience does get offended by the two women kissing. Well, the men won't mind too much. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the women will say, <laughs> Talking about that very subject, Harley, you're the first woman I've ever kissed on the lips with my mouth open, <laughs> and I certainly hope you're the last. But for the remaining <laughs> rehearsal period of this play, could you not eat camembert directly prior to our kiss? <laughs> for me, I have almost an hour to kill during Act One, which reminds me how I don't think I should have to sign in until at least 8.30, unless you would like me to sell accomplice t-shirts in the lobby. What do you want, Harley? You have a great scene in Act 2, Scene 2. I mean, you don't hear all the Ophelias that rather complain that Hamlet gets all the good lines, do you? <laughs> I mean, look, will it make you happy if we just rehearse your big speech? Oh, it'll make me happy if I don't have to bear my breasts in a four-character ca thriller where I have one-tenth of the line. Why do I get the feeling that that's a, a completely accurate figure, that you actually went to the trouble to count the total lines that each one of us has? It keeps me busy during Act 1 when I have nothing, nothing to, to do. do. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, Erica, Brian, could you give us a moment? How long? Oh, just five. Should we fail, Janet, 
Erica will be doing same time next year, this year, coming soon to a dinner theater near you. I will become the punchline of the great backstage joke about Erica's manager husband who wrote a quaint little thriller that would rise and fall on the summer stock market if it wasn't for Erica taking the lead role and the financial backing. And Brian, Brian will return to the role he created, understudy, standing by for the upcoming tour, a national tour of love letters which Mandy Patanka will no doubt be doing as a one-man show. <laughs> so it seems to me, Harley, that of all of us, you have the absolute least to lose. I just... Oh, no. I am not... <laughs> Harley... Harley... <laughs> Harley, yes, I want to use your body in my play. Which I should think would make you feel better than if I wanted to use your body outside my play. But in turn, I have a legitimate two-act thriller in New Haven prior to Broadway where we should all be so lucky with a legitimate cast of which I am prepared to consider you a full and equal partner. And which you, as both Janet's accomplice and then later as John's accomplice, Harley, you have the title role, okay? Okay. Okay. Erica, Brian. Everything all right? Oh, yes. I I'm sorry if I... I uh, totally understand. Certainly, dear. We've all been there. <laughs> Either you deal with this by the end of today or you deal me out. <laughs> Do you uh, deal out a complex kind of character, honey? How? The oobs, they are not worth the eighth grade. <laughs> right. Uh, so let's just take them from where we left off, okay? All right, so you've dropped the coat and the bra. <laughs> you can't just start this way. You have to at least lead me into no, it. No, no, of course. You're right, you're right. All right, so, so we'll go from Janet's line. We're indoors, John. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Listen. I'm supposed to be taking my bra off for Janet's benefit, right? So why would I do it facing forward? I mean, can you think of any reason why I wouldn't come around here and face Janet? I I'm not arguing the nudity, okay? It's just that, dramatically speaking, it's illogical for me to turn my back on Janet. <laughs> All right. For the time being, Marley can face Janet. But if you do not now remove your bra as indicated in the script, the audience will indeed view a revolutionary plot twist. For the director shall rise like Lazarus and stepping onto the stage cause great humiliation to one of his cast members in full view of a full house of witnesses. Because this cast member has caused the director to suffer cruel and inhuman punishment. Okay? Okay! okay. <laughs> All right. So, from where we left off. Yeah. My agent said this was going to be English, period English. I thought it was going to be like a Jane Austen movie. Yes, I'm oh, sure boy. that you thought this part. Kira Knightley was shitting a brick. <laughs> right. so, oh, oh. Uh, let's go from your line, Jay. Uh, we're in Joel's child. There's no need to wear a coat. I think you should take it off. She drops the coat. And? Now, slip under the covers, child, and we'll see what's what. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Now that I've seen it, I'm just thinking the nudity isn't right. Uh, <laughs> you can't say that to me now? You can't make me bear my breasts and just reject them? I just got out of diabetics! <laughs> well, you can't but what am I, Judge Judy? All right, here's my decision. <laughs> the bra stays on a busy <coughs> scene tonight, and we can run it again tomorrow. Well, frankly, thank God. Okay, and now, with that monumental issue resolved, uh, let's skip way ahead to the last two pages of the script, to uh, that great old hymn, Act 2, Scene 2, from Janet's line, I think I'll just stretch out. Oh, and uh, Erica, let's do it with the... Uh, Thing, right? Okay, well, since we're coming up to lunch, I think we'll just rehearse our Claridge Hotel set right here in the middle of our Dartmoor cottage. Now, this sofa bed will, of course, be disguised as a quite glamorous day bed in our quite glamorous, sinfully decadent Deco Hotel suite. Oh, 
silver and black and white and Fred and Ginger. Oh, chromium bookshelves, chromium lamps, chromium stationery. Oh, Brian, the table. Mm -hmm. Also, please remember that in our hotel set, this door has ceased to exist. It is now the door, the outer door of a 10-story bedroom suite in, in a hotel in London. And so if we dematerialize through it, people will think that they've wandered into a revival of Christ spirit. Also, please remember that this is no longer the door to the kitchen. That's now the door. That's now the door to the bedroom. Early! That's a good mantra, as much as I do. But do you think for the time being you could do something to, oh, I don't know, help us? Right, okay, also please remember that, that tomorrow will be our last opportunity to work in a theater with just a skeleton crew by ourselves. This is a new haven luxury, and we will not be able to do this on Broadway where every movement has a union of its own. Oh, uh, so please, <laughs> please remember, tomorrow we're gonna start rehearsing at noon, and if any one of you has a heart attack, please just keep moving your lips, okay? <laughs> and hardly, hardly wait. Uh, I thought that the Claire Richards Hotel lamp would help remind us where we are. I read that just one prop could help anchor a play. Where did you read that? In a book about acting. <laughs> Written by? Islovsky. Ah, that would be the Mr. Islovsky whose first name is Stan, Stan right? Okay, good. All right, Erica, so you will be lying on the couch, which is now folded up. Uh, John Bryan, you will be kneeling behind the couch. Melinda, you're at the foot of the couch. So here we go from your line, Janet, and go. Until the police arrive, I think I'll just stretch out for a while, darling. Yes, you will have a nice stretch, Janet. You've <laughs> certainly stretched your luck with me, haven't you? As in a stretch of time, and dot more prison they stretched her neck. Imagine her to be innocent, took some stretch of the imagination. They put her out on the rack and stretched her. Oh, hold it, hold it. Uh, Erica, I think maybe you should scream, not when John grabs your wrist, but when the Melinda raises the knife, okay? Yes, that makes more sense, doesn't it? Yes, I think so. Oh, Hal, love you. I'm sure this knife works. It frightens the shit out of me, frankly. Right. The blade attracts, <laughs> honest it does. But if you're still nervous, <laughs> you're still nervous. <laughs> oh, I'm all right. Oh, and Harvey, uh, stretching the neck, that, that, that hurts, doesn't it? Well, let me feel that pain. And in Dartmoor Prison, that's a gloomy place, right? So let me feel the fear within there. Oh, one other thing, Harley, your lover is here. Not here. So why don't you deliver it to her as if she's a uh, a person or something, okay? I think I've got it now. I'm very excited. <laughs> okay, run your line, Janet. <clears throat> I'll just stretch out for a while, darling. Mm, yes, you have a nice stretch, Janet. You've suddenly stretched your luck with me, haven't you? As in a stretch <coughs> of time and dot more prison, they stretch. Stunning. <laughs> Ready now to be innocent, to some stretch of the imagination. They put her out on the rack and stretch her. <laughs> we did it, John. <laughs> it all belongs to us now. I always knew you were the perfect wife, Melinda, but up until now, I never dreamt you'd be such an efficient. Accomplice. <laughs> <laughs> and curtain in the back too. Uh, the blood bag looks a little bogus. Oh, and Harley, uh, your knife plunge. It's got to be more emphatic, more assured. One smooth stroke. That's critical. Okay, it's just hard because I have to grab her from behind the yeah. books. Yeah, you'll you know? get it. You just need to commit to it. I liked the rhythm of the speech, though. Did you like the rhythm of the speech? It was good. Brian, did you like the rhythm of the speech? <laughs> Harley, you'll never be better than you were just now. Oh. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Erica, how did it sit with you? So, well, are we going to do this bit again? No, oh, no, we should break, really break for lunch. <laughs> Overtime. Uh, Nick, Kirsten, uh, that's it for today for you guys. You can wrap it up. Uh, we'll just we'll just work by ourselves for the rest of the day. If you could just leave some working lights up for us. Ah, thank you. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> now that's acting. Well, I can't go to lunch like this. I'm drenched in stage 
blood. Oh, I have a spare sweater in my dressing room. You can borrow one of mine. Oh, yes, that would do wonders for my ego. Wearing a sweater accommodated, designed to accommodate both of the evil twins. <laughs> Thanks anyway. No, oh, I should really straighten things up before the union gets on me for rehearsing without their total assistance. And then I have some serious things to, to, to work on. Oh, you mean as opposed to this play? Erica. See you in an hour and a bit. Hey, 55 minutes, sharp for a change. You don't have any special privileges. <laughs> How? When the bright school boy writes his clever essay and is rewarded by receiving the title principal for the day, it doesn't mean that he actually gets to change the curriculum. Yeah, that's the best parable I've heard all day. Accomplice is a very nice vehicle for me, darling, and it, I know it's all very exciting, you being a writer, a director, a driving force, and owning your own stopwatch. <laughs> but um, let's remember, when someone drives a vehicle with me and it He's usually called a chauffeur. And uh, let's not forget I am providing your salary, my salary. Oh, did we forget? How can I deny you the daily joy of bursting my bubble? Bursting your bubble requires nothing more than one little prick. <laughs> oh, and how? Do you remember we have those people from the Folger Library coming over to the house for coffee tonight? Mm -hmm. Folger, coffee. That's funny. We could use that instead of the Glenn Close joke. Yeah, good idea. Have a nice break. Break a leg. Yeah, yeah, you forgot your wallet again. Yeah, it's just mister. What do you want to give to her? Yeah, I'd like to give it to her. <laughs> hey, look, be a man should help me with this break, will you? Oh, sure. You're, uh, sure Eric will need her, uh, wallet? That's a spare wallet. Her spare wallet. My wife's hobby is collecting money. She won't be satisfied until she gets the complete set. <laughs> <laughs>